Hey Siri, what would be a boring first line for a YouTube video? On March 26, 2003, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uploaded a file to its website. Ooh, that's good. What would it be about? Me. What? How? Do your own research. Uh... Loser. Hey, I'm not a- I searched the web, and Sam is, indeed, a loser. Okay, enough of her. Anyway, on March 26, 2003, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uploaded a file to its website. 619,449 emails sent from or to 158 of a disgraced energy company's top brass in the three and a half years before their financial crimes drove them bankrupt. The emails are evidence of those crimes, but also turned out to be a goldmine for computer scientists who use them to build technologies that are still in our lives today, even if those technologies are rude. This is the Enron Corpus. But what makes it so special? And why did I say this many emails a second ago when my title says this many? Well, sit tight, because much like clubmonkey.com vis-a-vis a party at least one Enron employee was planning to attend on October 25th, 2001, I have all the details. Our story starts in California, one of the many places the Enronese did crime. And we know that because they emailed each other about how to do crimes there. Federal investigators pulled tons and tons of Enron's emails to prove this, but they couldn't read them all. They found what they needed, but figured they'd missed a lot too. So in the name of transparency, they threw all the emails online after the investigation to let the public find stuff they missed. Enron got some emails taken down, mostly ones with social security numbers and other secure info, but the majority stayed public, extremely disorganized and hard to parse, but public. Then, MIT professor and member of the public Leslie Kilding dropped $10,000 to get all those emails onto a disk, then worked with a bunch of researchers to organize them, remove duplicates, and put them all up again. This version of the dataset is what's known as the Enron Corpus. 517,431 emails from 151 Enronese in 4,700 folders, all clean, free, and usable for whatever your heart may desire. And what did I desire? Gossip, obviously, and there's plenty. Yeah, FERC got rid of social security numbers, but not people being confused about what the Lion King is, seeking awards, or trying and failing to break up. My favorite pattern we spotted in the Enron Corpus is on display here and here. In this one, we have a guy seemingly confessing a longtime crush on a former coworker after something happened between them on Wednesday. It's soaked in regret, but also hope. The writer doesn't have an Enron address, so it's only in the corpus because the Enron employee he emailed forwarded it to her friend within the company. And oh what I would give to be a fly on the wall at Susan and Monique's lunch on October 30th, 2000. Similar idea, different content. Here we have an email in which a guy who calls himself Georgetown writes a graphic fanfiction about the guy he's emailing potentially hooking up with someone he met at a wedding. Again, not an Enron address, but the recipient forwards this email to a fellow Enronee, noting that he does not want to hang out with this guy. Let me tell you, leafing through the Enron corpus in search of juicy gossip is a pain. There's a lot of boring nonsense in there. But it's so worth it when you find, say, blatant 2 p.m. lust. If you were single, that's pretty heavy-handed exposition. Did they know I'd be reading this? The answer, of course, is no. None of them could predict that these emails would become sorta kinda public domain. I say sorta kinda because they're not public domain. Technically, some of the email writers could claim copyright over some of the emails, but none of them ever have, so computer people ran wild with the corpus, and I'm pitching that love letter as a short film. Large, conversational, organic, public language datasets are, to put it lightly, rare. Maxing any one of these features should come at the expense of another. Really big datasets are usually either expensive or private. Deutsche Bank isn't going to hand over all their emails for funsies. Smaller datasets, like, say, your own emails, are accessible, but they won't train an algorithm as well, unless you're trying to train an Uncle AI to auto-forward you conspiracy theories with the subject line, you hear about this? There's also, often, a push and pull between language data that's conversational and language data that's organic. There's oodles of real language out there. Wikipedia, public records, my blog. But if you're trying to teach a robot to talk like a person, you want to feed it conversation. Today's internet is full of such things. Comment sections, DMs, and seat chat. But that data is private too. Often, people wanting to study conversations have to cook up synthetics by giving undergrads $5 or something to gab in a lab. And that's all well and good, but the researchers usually dictate the topic, and you can't guarantee that people will act totally natural while a bunch of white coats watch through a window. So the Enron Corpus was the whole package. Organic, conversational, massive, free. And because of that, it got used for a ton of stuff. 
off. Spam filters, organizers, summarizers, fraud detection, tools to surface priority emails within your inbox, or tell you if you forgot to respond to something important. Google even used the Enron corpus to train an early version of Smart Compose, you know, that feature that tells you to reply to an email that says, are you free for lunch on Thursday with, yep, sounds good. By the way, I just thought of a way to manipulate the energy market in California. Are you available on Sunday to cheat on my wife? Perhaps the most consequential thing the fine people at Enron gave us, besides negative $74 billion, was Siri. See, once upon a time, these guys contracted these guys to make this thing, which stands for Cognitive Assistant That Learns and Organizes. They were trying to train their robot, Siri, on smaller sets of emails, but it was tough. Enter the Enron emails, which did far better than all those mini sets could ever dream to. Eventually, the Siri people launched their app, Apple bought them out for $200 million and folded them into their OS, and the rest is history. Now, the Siri that came to market, let alone whichever version of her is kicking in your phone now, is a far cry from the early version that got trained on the Enron corpus. This is because, actually, training language models on the Enron corpus is not a good idea. See, there's this principle in AI called garbage in, garbage out, i.e. algorithms reflect the flaws and biases in the data they're trained on. Think of it like this. If the only movie you'd ever seen was The Ant Bully, and then you were asked what a movie is, you might say, a movie is when a computer animated child bullies ants, which is true based on your training data, but is not very reflective of what happens in Citizen Kane. Training bots on the Enron corpus alone would teach them to talk like ethically loose late 90s energy executives, which wouldn't be great. Think about it. This dataset also gets used to study misogyny in the workplace. Should it be our go-to model of how people talk? No! And the good news? It isn't. Today's language models, including those behind Siri, Smart Compose, and basically any other tool developed on the Enron corpus, train on far more comprehensive data than this. But nevertheless, the Enron corpus is an important and singular piece of tech's history. It was a godsend to a young industry and a fun read for nosy people. So Enron emails, here's to you. You're mostly spam and boring. The parts of you that aren't boring are often pretty messed up. But still, you gave the nerds a lot to play with, and now my phone tells me the weather. Cheers. Okay, so garbage in, garbage out is an AI thing, but it's true in other parts of life. For example, if I eat dino nuggets for half my meals in a given week, I feel like garbage. Luckily, I don't have to do that thanks to this video's sponsor, Factor. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen, pre-made meals right to your doorstep. It's insanely convenient. You just pick from 34 or more meals online every week, and boom, there they are. So if you're way too busy, or let's be honest, lazy, to cook, they'll save you from turning to the dino nuggets or overpriced takeout every night. I'm a real-life customer of Factors, in part because I value the convenience, but also because the meals are just really, really good. They're owned by HelloFresh, and while making a Factor meal is faster than cooking a HelloFresh one, both companies consistently send me dinners that I love, packed with flavor and high-quality ingredients. So if you want to take out all the hassle of a good meal, why not give Factor a try? Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code HAI50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. 